Welcome to this event. Thanks for your interest in climate change and development, one of the most pressing issues of the 21st century. Uh, I'm Jeff Heal, and I'm going to act as a master of ceremonies and possibly as a brief discussant afterwards. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Nick Stern. Uh, Nick is an old friend of mine. We go back to Cambridge many, many years ago. Uh, since graduating from Cambridge, Nick has had a very diverse and interesting and distinguished career. He was an academic, taught at Oxford and at Warwick and at London School of Economics. And then he also went off out of academia and became the chief economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, then the chief economist and director of the World Bank, and then the head of the UK Government Economic Service, in which context he was the advisor, economic advisor to Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. And while he was in that role, he wrote what's known as the Stern Review of the Economics of Climate Change as a report for the UK government on the economics of climate change. It was a really game-changing report on the economics of climate change, um, which was in some, in some ways quite controversial. <laughs> uh, but now I think it's really generally accepted as giving an accurate picture of the economics of climate change. Um, Snick is a guy with very many skills and very many contacts. I'm sure he's going to have something very interesting to say about climate change and development. After Nick has spoken, uh, the format will be Nick will speak for 40, 45 minutes. Then Scott Barrett, who's sitting right here so he can see the slides, uh, will act as the first discussant and I'll act as the second discussant. We'll aim to leave at least half an hour for Q&A uh, by the time everybody's finished. Nick, all yours. Thanks, Jeff, and um, it's very nice to be back in, uh, in Columbia. You didn't say what I'm doing now, which is my true identity, and I'm a professor at the London School of Economics. That's, uh, that's what I do for a living. Um, can you all hear me? Is this working, the, the mic? Yeah. Yeah. If it doesn't, can you draw this to my attention? Right. Um, and what Jeff also added when he mentioned we'd known each other for a long time, he, he actually meant uh, 42 years, so I think it <laughs> counts as an embarrassingly long, uh, embarrassingly long time. <laughs> now, um, I want to um, talk today uh, about targets and a global deal. So I'm not going to try to be comprehensive on the economics of climate change. I have given talks in Colombia with a broader remit, as it were, and I've been involved, as many people have, including Scott and Jeff, um, in talking to people who are trying to make a global deal on climate change. So what we're trying to offer is uh, ways of looking at it, ways forward, ways of understanding um, what we have to do and eventually getting to um, responsibilities of different parties. There are many, many strands to that, but I'm going to focus particularly on the quantitative one of targets. I'm going to approach it from the perspective of growth and carbon budgets. So in other words, um, no one wants to sacrifice growth, particularly in uh, the case of developing countries, some of which are now growing reasonably rapidly and giving themselves a decent chance of overcoming uh, some of the more extreme poverty in the next 20 or 30 years. So the question then is how can you manage climate change responsibly and yield that growth? Um, and I'm going to be fairly arithmetical about answering that question. Um, if you want to see growth and you want to see, you want to have a carbon budget, then basically something's got to happen to emissions per unit of output. So that's where I'll be focusing. And what I've been working on recently is trying to do these numbers from the point of view of being helpful to the environment and other ministers who are actually negotiating the deal. So prior to trying this out on a really intellectual audience, I tried it out on the environment ministers uh, uh, yesterday. And uh, they did seem interested in the numbers, but then that's because they've got to negotiate them. But I hope you'll be interested anyway. So because the story is about growth and carbon budgets. Um, it's very much a story about um, development. Now, I and everybody else are well aware of the difference between growth and development, and um, Jeff and I were in Paris uh, a week ago uh, for the launch of the uh, Sarkozy, Stiglitz, and Fitoussi, Heal uh, report on measuring well-being. So just because I'm focusing on growth at the moment, please don't misread me 
that I think that that's the only thing that matters about development. It isn't, and I'm more than happy to talk about that kind of thing in the discussion. But in a fairly crude way, it is a key element in uh, overcoming poverty and uh, also of fundamental relevance. Uh, it's uh, central to the objectives of many of the developing countries themselves. So um, this is the perspective that I'm coming from, and it reflects what I think are the two defining challenges of this century, which is overcoming poverty and managing climate change. The challenge of overcoming poverty is urgent. It's the story of the next 20 or 30 years, um, if we're successful, much longer than if we're not. Um, the challenge of overcoming climate change also involves urgent action now, but the damages that you're avoiding are particularly severe further down the track. So it's bringing together, as it were, the desire to get results on poverty in the short run, by that I mean the next couple of decades, and uh, the desire to manage uh, climate change in the longer run, when it's quite clear from the structure of both problems that you have to act on both of them now. So let me start with um, a story which uh, is of the overall risk. But it will remind ourselves, when we look at that overall risk, that we're going to succeed or fail on these two defining challenges of our century together. If we fail to manage climate change, the effect on the uh, physical environment will be so severe that we will um, not only stop progress, but we'll reverse it. Um, so it's very clear that managing climate change is crucial to overcoming poverty in any kind of sustained way. But also, it's clear that the relationship goes the other way. If we try to manage climate change in a way that appears to stop growth and development or slow it down drastically over the next two or three decades, then we'll never have a coalition of the kind that is absolutely crucial to managing climate change. So that's the sense in which I think it's very clear that we succeed or fail on these two issues together. The horse, it's a totally artificial horse race to say, uh, are we going to go for growth and development or are we going to manage climate change? Um, I emphasize what seems to me to be blindingly obvious simply because it doesn't seem to be always blindingly obvious to uh, everybody. Um, those of you who, uh, who uh, watch uh, John Cleese in Monty Python and Faulty Towers will know that there's a very precise technical philosophical meaning to blindingly obvious. <laughs> now, what happens if we fail to manage climate change? Let me now develop more specifically the story of the risks we run, because this is about management of risk. And uh, all too often in the economics of climate change, people try to see this in terms of narrow cost benefit analysis between uh, you know, investment costs now and uh, avoided damages in the future, where in many cases, it's less so now, but in many cases the whole story of risk wasn't central. Um, that, I think, is the wrong way to do it. I tried to set out we tried to set that, out that argument in the review, but we weren't, I think, in retrospect, successful enough in stressing that it was all about risk management. People, some people did interpret what we had in the Stern Review as sort of narrow cost-benefit approach to all this, which, which, which we didn't, although there were times when we made it appear that we did, which is why some people interpreted it that way. But I did try to set out that story of risk management in, the, uh, in a more technical way in the American Economic Review in May of... Uh, last year. That was my uh, Richard Ely lecture. But let's just think it through without getting formal but because the results, I think, when you think it through, are pretty clear. We are around, uh, and I must uh, apologize in advance for the crudeness of the climate science that I'm offering here. Um, I hope it's not too crude, but you can tell me, those of you who are proper climate scientists. We are now, roughly speaking, 435 parts per million CO2 equivalent, if you add the... Am I allowed to take my jacket off there? No. Um, I, and it, <coughs> uh, you, you never quite know what the local culture is, particularly in a seminar run by an Englishman or Welshman, I suppose. Um, the, we're adding about two and a half parts per million a year, and that's rising. 
Um, so a century of that, I mean, I'm orders of magnitude now, nothing too precise, but the orders of magnitude are pretty clear. If we didn't manage climate change, then over about a century we'd add, on average, over three a year parts per million CO2 equivalent to the concentrations in the atmosphere. Already adding two and a half and it's rising. So that would mean if we ran that forward, roughly speaking, sometime around the end of this century, that 435 would have been transformed to something like 750. If you look at the kind of probabilities of eventual temperature increases that arise from that kind of concentration, even if you stopped it right there, you get numbers, and I'm working mostly off the Hadley Center at, in uh, the UK, but there are similar results from others who have modeled it using climate models elsewhere. You'd get eventually, probably sometime in the first decades of next century, a roughly 50-50 chance of being above 5 degrees centigrade, above middle of the 19th century. That's the models, that the, 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 you know, the, the general climate models that... Um, people build, those are the kinds of answers that they give. What does that mean? Well, we haven't been at 5 degrees centigrade um, for about 30 million years. Humans have been around for about 200,000, and that's a fairly generous uh, interpretation of sapiens in Homo sapiens. But 200,000, in other words, we will be seeing temperatures that we haven't seen for 30 million years. We've been around for 200,000. Our ability to adapt to those kind of temperature increases in any uh, sensible definition of adaptation would be with enormous difficulty. And it would involve population movement. The last time we were 5 degrees centigrade less than we are now was very recently, 10 or 12,000 years ago, uh, the last ice age. Um, ice came down, ice sheets came down roughly to the latitude of London, which you can tell from my accent is a roughly standard latitude, reference latitude and uh, not so far from New York. And where were people? Because there were people. They were closer to the equator than that. These kinds of temperature changes move people on a massive scale. They move coastlines. They move rivers. They transform areas into deserts. Uh, others er other areas um, become battered by hurricanes. Most of southern Europe would probably be like the Sahara Desert. All this is probably because this is a risk story. We can't be that precise. But surely we can say that 5 degrees centigrade uh, above uh, the middle of the 19th century as a standard reference period would involve movements of hundreds of millions of people. And it's reasonable to suppose that that would involve um, extended severe uh, and uh, global conflict. Now, you can't put precise cost-benefit numbers on this kind of story with any degree of sense. But it is surely something that any sensible view of risk management would tell you that this 50% probability of going somewhere like that um, is far, far more than it would make any sense for a rational world to risk, particularly when you look at what can be done to avoid it and you find out that uh, that story is quite an attractive one. The, um, I told the story in five degrees centigrade. Now you can tell stories. This is a probability distribution. Now you see you have three degrees and four degrees and five degrees and six degrees and uh, uh, you know anything much above three degrees or indeed arguably above two degrees looks very unattractive. But I told the story in five degrees centigrade because if you run that one a hundred years forward from now you get a roughly 50-50 chance of being either side of, uh, of that. So there's obviously uh, this is the kind of story that you wouldn't want to go anywhere near. What could you do if you acted strongly now? Well, we will be at 450 parts per million. I think, with, I, can, can, I, think I can predict fairly strongly that around 2015, plus or minus a year, uh, we'll be at 450 parts per million. This is uh, really complicated arithmetic, two and a half per year multiplied by uh, six that's 15, add to 435, and that's uh, 450. So that's not a hard uh, prediction to do. We can't hold it below 450, but we'd like to get there, like to get back there. We probably could hold below 500. And most of the story I'm telling is about holding below 500, and then over time bringing it on back from there with difficulty. Um, but, you know, you have 
people like Klaus Lackner who's going to make artificial trees and pull the stuff out of the air or we'll have um, carbon capture and storage for biomass. Uh, maybe we can get it back down. And uh, eventually if we go on cutting our emissions for long enough, we can get it back down. But that's the story, roughly speaking, that uh, I'm telling to give us a reasonable chance, perhaps not as high as 50-50, but a reasonable chance of holding below 2 degrees centigrade. So that's the challenge. What would it cost us to do that? Well, there actually been a whole collection of studies of what that might cost. The 1 or 2 percent of GDP that we came up, in the Stern, came up with in the Stern Review, in retrospect, has turned out on the high side probably of the majority of the estimates of the costs of doing that. It's not the highest, there are higher estimates, but most studies have come in with costs rather le less than that. Roughly speaking in terms, you know, looking at the kind of costs of uh, reducing um, um, carbon dioxide with a price on the carbon dioxide, that's a very aggregate way of doing it, and others have worked um, bottom up. But to give you an idea of the order of magnitude, um, we probably have to take out by 2050, relative to business as usual, order of magnitude 60 or 70 gigatons. You know, if you multiply that by um, a price on average, not the marginal price, but the average price of 30 some dollars, remembering that giga and billion are the same. Unfortunately, scientists use giga and economists use billion, but that shouldn't worry us. You know, if you multiply $30 a ton and 60 gigatons or 60 billion, you know, you get, well, 1.8 trillion if you take it literally. World GDP in 2050, 100 trillion. So you can see that, you know, that's roughly order of magnitude 2%. It's just a very crude check. That's not the way you do it. You have to do it, you know, bottom up and in detail and so on. But those are the kind of numbers that come out the other end. So it's not fanciful, this 1 or 2 percent of GDP. But uh, I actually think the story of cost isn't the best way to tell this one. I think this is a story of investment opportunity because what's involved in investment in new technologies where we'll be learning like mad. Now we can't be very concrete about this but I think it's a reasonable case if you look at the way in which technical progress is taking place already, if you look at the way in which these investments would cut across the whole economy, now housing, transport, electricity, stopping deforestation and so on, that uh, what we are telling is a story of um, the most dynamic period of economic growth in probably that we've seen in economic history. Presumably, given its uh, spread and given the kind of technologies we've got available, it cuts right across the whole economy. This is something stronger than the railways or... Uh, electricity in earlier periods of economic history in the rich countries. So you can tell the story in terms of cost. How much extra does it cost to do things? And that's the way in which much of the discussion has gone in economics, but I prefer to tell it as an investment and growth story. Less easy to be quantitative and specific, unfortunately, but some are working and uh, we're doing some stuff with Philippe Aguillon and so on, which trying to sort of tell an endogenous growth story. About, about this. But that story I just told about the most dynamic period of growth in economic history is one I actually take seriously, but is actually quite hard to, uh, to quantify. So that's, I think, a story of why we should be doing all this. And, you know, as I tell it um, quite often, it becomes more and more of a no brainer. Uh, but, you know, you, you do have to tell it because the starting point for all the numbers I'm about to. Uh, put up are exactly what I've just said. So what you have to do to try to hold below 500 parts per million or thereabouts and start bringing on down, um, that's a stock. So we're asking what are the flow paths of emissions that might do that for us? Now I'm sorry that this is uh, your young audience so your eyesight is better but the older ones might find that um, a bit tricky. But the point is the main uh, outlines there, not, not the precision. Um, that blue thing at the top 
is roughly business as usual, starting from, and I want, this, want you to remember this number, 50 gigatons where we are uh, now. Where are we now? 50 gigatons, I hear you cry. So the, um, that blue one is a rough sort of story of business as usual. Business as usual is a fairly slippery conceptual uh, notion, but uh, it, that doesn't have to be precise. Then the other path, um, the path um, at the right at the bottom is one that sort of tries to stabilise at 450. I regard that as slightly implausible. But the other three paths are paths which um, fit with this story of um, holding below or around 500 parts per million and then bringing on down uh, from there. And uh, you can see that... Uh, there, one peaks very early, and then the other one peaks. I'm talking about the three paths now, between the bottom one and the blue one at the top. So one peaks uh, very soon, the other slightly less soon, and the other slightly less soon. And if you go on the outside one, the, that uh, one that peaks latest, you can see, in order to stabilise and and then or in order to stop it rising above and then bringing on down, you have to. Uh, reduce your emissions far more rapidly on such a path. The um, path that um, peaks earliest um, it would give you a point in 2050 of 20 gigatons. Can I ask you to remember that number as well? 20 gigatons in uh, 2050. And those paths, all three of them really, don't go much above or in fact slightly below 35 gigatons in 2030. So what you've got then is a story where we're 50 now. I mean, we wish we weren't, but we're 50 gigatons CO2 equivalent now. We've got to get down to roughly 20, and that'll go through 35. That's probably not a straight line, but indeed I haven't drawn it as a straight line. But you do actually, on these paths, have a... Will I get a blue? I should get a green one, shouldn't I? Yeah, there's a straight line. But it's um, the ones I've drawn sort of rise up above the straight line and then dip down below it. But they go through uh, 35, roughly speaking. So that tells us the story of from here to there. Now, what really matters, of course, roughly, not precisely, but what really matters is the area under the curve, the integral of the emissions across the period and on beyond 2050, of course. And that's why it is that if you rise above earlier, you have to come down sharply later. But I don't want to go into the great detail on that path. There will always be people who say, well, why don't we do uh, less now and more later? But you can see from this that uh, the more you do less now, you have to do much more later to catch up, catch up and drop very quickly. So that's the 50, 35, 20. Right at the end, I had this sort of rather cheerful story of a global deal in six numbers. Um, and... Uh, Three of those numbers are uh, 50, 35, and 20. So that's half the global deal. Um, not quite. You'll see the story as it, as it develops. So what then about growth and carbon budgets? So I'll tell the story very simply as a carbon budget of 35 in 2030. And I'll ask, well... What if the key parts of the world try to grow at something like growth rates that they've seen in the past? Uh, of course, many people would like to accelerate, but something like growth rates they've seen in the past, what would have to happen to emissions of unit of output for us to get as a world within this uh, carbon budget constraint, which CO2 equivalent budget constraint, in uh, 2030? Now, again, um, it doesn't, I'll tell you what's here if your eyesight is not sufficient. This is on uh, our LSE website. Um, in your honour, we put it up today on the LSE uh, website so you can see these numbers. But in the... Um, and that's why it's so small, because it's a table from a paper rather than uh, just a slide. But the key thing here is first the assumptions and then what you have to do to emissions per unit of output to satisfy those growth rate assumptions and uh, reach your carbon budget in 2030. 
I'm assuming that India and China uh, grow at um, 7%. Not hugely ambitious, given the recent history of those countries, and I'm actually assuming it's overall growth, not per capita growth. So this isn't a wild, wildly strong assumption about growth in uh, China and in India. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, the US, EU, Japan grows at uh, uh, 2.5%. Percent, and in and um, Indonesia and Brazil at five percent. Crudely historical growth rates in the recent past. So we're asking the question. This isn't a formal model of what growth rates will be. We're asking the question: What if people sought out and achieved those kinds of growth rates, and we needed to uh, meet these carbon budget constraints? What would uh, emissions per unit of output have to be. So it re-expresses the story of the growth ambitions and the uh, carbon budgets in terms of emissions per unit of output. And there are four cases, uh, four cases here. And um, just think first of, of for example, where, where China is now. China is roughly eight gigatons. And one of the uh, easinesses of 7% is it doubles in a decade. And then um, you all know why. It's because log to the base E is 0.69, but you can, you can work that out. Um, the, uh, it doubles in decade. So if China had emissions per unit of output constant, it would quadruple in two decades. The eight in China would become 32 out of a carbon budget constraint of 35. Well, that doesn't look uh, feasible. So if you play those games with India and, uh, and the US and so on, it's very easy to do this arithmetic, which is why I set it up this way. I didn't want this to be mysterious black box modeling or spreadsheets that only McKinsey's can understand. This is a, a story of which anybody should be able to check very quickly for, for themselves. You can see again, if China was at, uh, is at which it is, about eight gigatons uh, now, and grew at 7% for two decades and cut emissions per unit of output by a half. That would take China to 16, you know, a little over 1 billion people, 8 billion in 2030. It's clearly not feasible either uh, to have China with 16 out of 35. So that's not going to work. And I'm just giving you the figures, you know, as you go down the rows, but expressing it in terms of China because they start off with eight, and we're assuming that uh, growth rates are a bit less than in the past, but still uh, 7%. If you do the arithmetic, the only one that makes sense is the one at uh, the bottom, which we've called scenario, for, scenario four, and that has uh, China, US, EU, Japan, Indonesia, and Brazil all cutting emissions per unit of output by a factor of four. And I've got India cutting emissions per unit of output by a factor of two, because, I mean, it's somewhat arbitrary, but India is so far below uh, everybody else in this table. India's emissions per unit of output, it's right, India's emissions per capita would be about 1.7, 1.8 now, and China's would be about 6, and the US 25 or more. Um, so I just had a lower factor for, for India on, on this one. Um, but basically, the story is actually very simple. If you want those growth numbers to go forward, roughly in historical terms, for the next two decades, we have to find emissions per unit of output cut by a factor of four over the next 20 years. Now, if you cut them by a factor of a bit less than four, then further down the track, you're going to have to cut back harder. But it gives you a ballpark. Emissions per unit of output halving is clearly not going to, clearly not going to work, and neither would actually be dividing by three. You have to go somewhere. Emissions per unit of output being cut by a factor of four, or cut by a factor of two each decade. Now the first decade is going to be harder because you start with a fixed infrastructure, fixed structure of buildings. So you, you would expect to uh, accelerate, but it gives you the scale of the action that's necessary. Now, China works off five-year plans, and China usually achieves its five-year plans. In my view, usually genuinely. It's not just fiddling with the statistics. In the 11th five-year plan, which is, finishes at the end of next year, 
China cuts, uh, or will have cut by the end of next year, energy unit output by 20% over the five-year plan. Um, well, suppose you want to cut emissions per unit of output by a factor of two over a decade. And here's a bit of high school arithmetic that you will remember. As you multiply by 0.5 over a decade, you multiply by the square root of 0.5 over the five-year plan. The square root of 0.5 is 0.71. So you cut emissions per unit of output by 29% over the uh, five-year plan period. If you cut energy per unit of output by 20% and emissions per unit of output um, by 10%, so the 20% on energy per unit of output, did I, what, I, that last statement I said wrongly, 20% on energy per unit of output and 10% on emissions per unit of energy, yeah? Energy per unit of output, emissions per unit of energy, so 20% on the first, 10% on the second, so you're multiplying 0.8 by 0.9, which is 0.72, which is close enough, it's actually 28%, but it's close enough, 29%. So in these negotiations, you'll hear some of the United States negotiators, notwithstanding that the US isn't planning to do very much, but you've got the um, saying that what we would take from China is 25% emissions per unit of output in the 12th five-year plan. So you're starting to talk. Now these are just, these are illustrative, but the quantities that I've been speaking about and the ratios that you need haven't got that much flexibility in them to satisfy the kind of simple growth and carbon target emissions. So um, I think we've got reality in the, or we did have reality in the title of the paper so that the reality story I wanted to underline was the scale of the action that's uh, necessary. And that really is the most important message from this, is uh, to get a feeling for the growth and the carbon budget story and ask ourselves what emissions per unit of output assumptions are necessary. But doing it this way also forces you to do adding up. And one of the unrealities in much of the uh, discussions of global agreements on climate change is the unreality in the adding up. Wherever you go, people will say, look, put your arm around you and say, look, Nick, I understand the global targets. Of course we can't go beyond 20 gigatons in 2050. But you have to understand that South Africa is different or China is different or, you know, um, United States is different. You have to understand how difficult it is for us. I actually think that if we force ourselves to do it in this quantitative gigatons, non-percentage as it were, matrix form, then you actually force the adding up into the story. You force yourself into the discipline of seeing how all this fits together. And I think what we're going to need in Copenhagen is, you know, you can do this on a blank piece of paper with a bit of a pencil and just check what everybody is offering. Anyway, that's what we did. Um, I'm not going to say very much about 2020. Um, but there's stories that you have to tell, because I told about the two decades. Yes, we must recognize that we'll do less in the first decade than in the second decade because of the fixed infrastructure. And this 2020 story is pursuing that a little bit, but I, I won't have time to go into that in any uh, detail, except just to note one thing, that basically the 2020 story looks to be around 44 gigatons. Uh, so in other words, if you're going from 50 now to 35 in two decades, you can do six in the first decade and nine in the second decade, and that leaves you at 44 for 2020 along these paths. You can talk it up a bit. You probably can talk the 44 up to 48. But if you do that, if you remember that, uh, or this diagram which I've replicated here, it means you have to do so much more later on if you push that story up. Um, so if you think of 44 versus 48, 48 is close to where we are now. That would be peaking close to 2020 in the world. A 44 would be peaking you know, within five years or so for, for the world. But if you look up what everybody's offered, offered is the wrong word, suggested, indicated as possible. You know, you've got 
Japan has declared for 25% reductions just about 10 days ago, 1990 to 2020. The European Union has uh, declared for 20% reductions some time ago, in fact, more than two, more than two years ago now, 20% reductions, 1990 to uh, 2020. Depending how you interpret Waxman Markey, it's close to 0% reductions, 1990 to 2020. I mean, you might be able to talk it up to 4 or 5% reductions, 1990 to 2020. Not because it's actually that feeble, but uh, the US has moved up so much since uh, 1990 that to get uh, much below 1990 levels in the next decade in the US will be quite hard. Now, as I've told this story, um, there are no offsets in these offers. I'll say something about that in just uh, a moment. But if you actually add up all those bits and you add up uh, China's plans and you just roll forward the energy per unit of output um, from the 11th plan into the 12th, look at some of the targets for renewables, do similar things for India, take uh, um, Brazil's climate change action plan, which was published uh, uh, just under a year ago, look at Mexico's plans and so on. If you run all these things through, you actually get, and you add them all up, that if everybody delivered on what they've been suggesting for 2020, it would be about 48 or 49. So we're only, uh, only is a, not quite the right word, but we're four or five gigatons short. So you can imagine a story that we squeezed out another one or two gigatons because they'll listen to Jeff on deforestation, that you might get another one or two uh, from the rich countries, another one or two from the poor countries. And uh, you could conceivably get to 44. So the story that I told, I deliberately made it sound quite fierce, you know, emissions unit of output coming down very hard. And it is quite fierce expressed that way. But if you look at what people are actually talking about in their own countries, in their own blocks, it doesn't look so far away. So when people sort of approach Copenhagen and their sort of shoulders drop and say it's all too difficult and... We've got to understand other people's difficulties, so we'll relax these objectives a bit. I think at the moment that's too defeatist. I think there really is a chance that we could put together a set of ambitions, country by country, designed country by country, that may actually get us quite close to where we need to be. And that's a story which I think is very important to keep examining before... Um, we decide to relax it all and uh, go for higher prob much, much higher probabilities of unpleasant temperatures and so on. So out of this very simple approach to the arithmetic, I think you do become not necessarily optimistic or saying it's easy because it's, it's going to be very difficult not only to get the agreement but also to put the policies in place that will get us there. But I do think that... Uh, the focus on this issue, if you look at the specifics of the plans around the world, is such that we could actually get onto a path that would give us a decent chance, maybe not 50%, but give us a decent chance of holding below 2 degrees centigrade by stopping temperatures rising, uh, stop, by stopping concentrations rising much above 500 parts per million and starting to find ways of bringing them on down from there. So let me... That's the story that I was telling just now of add, adding up the various bits and pieces. Much better that I told you about it before putting the slides up because it's, uh, it's tough to read. But that's the numerical side. And again, those of you who'd like to see the paper, it's, uh, just go to the www.lsc.ac.uk and look for Stern and Grantham Institute and that sort of thing. Um, so... Here's the uh, global deal in six numbers. The current draft of the treaty is, Scott, what, 200 and some pages by now? I think it's over 200. Um, you can get it on one piece of paper, and no president or prime minister is going to understand 200 pages of text, and this cannot be agreed by anybody other than presidents and prime ministers. So there has to be a simple framework. Well, I already gave you three of the numbers. 20 gigatons, in, uh, 20 gigatons in 2050 
is roughly two tons per capita. There'll be nine billion of us, you know, plus, or fine, plus or minus a few, on, in the world in uh, 2050. Those of you who want to uh, go around increasing the death rate and forcing people to do various things might think you can get it down much below that, but the demographers, um, you know, and I'm just using UN forecasts here that nine billion people in 2050, 6.7 or so now. The, uh, so divide 20 gigatons by 9 billion, or, and remember giga and billion are the same, so that's 20 divided by 9, which is 2.2. The average for the world will be close to 2 tons per capita in this story by 2050. As I mentioned, US 25 plus, Europe 10 to 12, this is now, right? This is Europe 10 to 12, China 6, India 1.7, much of sub-Saharan Africa uh, under one. That's the distribution at the moment. Well, the uh, Europe, um, understandably, has an 80% reduction, um, which is dividing by five, taking its 10 or 12 down to around two. That's the right ballpark over the period 1990 to, uh, to 2050. Now, the reason I'm underlining this is that if the average for the world is around two tons per capita, there probably won't be many people under two. Now, this isn't Lake Wobegon. You remember Lake Wobegon where all the women are strong and all the men are beautiful and all the children are above average. This isn't, the average is the average. So if there are not many people below two, when I was here in the United States for three and a half years, I spent my Saturday mornings listening to Prairie Home Companion and Car Talk. It was one of the... Uh, <laughs> one of the cultural delights of the United States. Uh, but the average is the average. There are not many people below two. There can't be many people above two. So in terms of actual emissions, that's why I think we have to speak of 80% cuts in rich countries. Now, of course, for the US to get 25 down to two, it's dividing by more or less 10. It's not dividing by five. But I think this is a story that once you set off on a good path, after two, three decades, you'll find out all sorts of ways of doing things, and it's not much point getting fussed about 80% or 90% from sitting from here four decades down the track. But the 80% story for rich countries is not vacuous. It comes out of um, the kind of analysis I've been describing. So what I've really been describing, 50% cuts for the world as a whole, 1990 to 2050, because 1990 was around 40 gigatons, uh, and 80% for rich countries, 1990 to 2050, are around the kind of discussions that have been taking place, really for two years now. So on the whole, that's another feature of the numbers. It's not way off from what we've been uh, talking about. Um, feasibility is another thing. The economic policies and so on, which we've all discussed elsewhere, it's not my subject today, but there's a good chance of, through the right kinds of investments in technologies, energy efficiency and uh, economic instruments, there's a good chance that we can get there. So I wanted to tell the story through very simple numbers. I've just given you the fourth of the numbers here, which is the 80%. Now, the two other numbers, again, are very ballpark numbers, but they're 100 and 100, 100 billion per annum, 100 billion per annum. But the kinds of flows that would, need, would be necessary from rich country to poor countries sometime in the 2020s. I'm, I'm deliberately not, but the, we can't be precise here because we're going to find out a lot along the uh, way. But if you take the UNDP's um, calculations of um, meeting Millennium Development Goals in a more hostile climate, uh, for 2015, they had about 86 billion. For 2015, now these numbers here for adaptation are for early 2020s when of course it would be more difficult because there will have been more change. So that's the kind of number you get from the 100 uh, for adaptation. The 100 for mitigation you, you build up in terms of looking at the different kinds of costs of reductions in, uh, in different countries and McKinsey's have done work in this kind of area and we have at the LSE, there was some in the, in the, uh, in the Stern Review. So these are the kinds of numbers that come out at the other end. I don't know if 100 is 80 or 120, but it's this kind of um, ballpark. Now, $100 billion is, again, quite small in relation to the 
grand order of things. Indeed, $200 billion is quite small in relation to the grand order of things. I mean, we're a 60 trillion world economy now. Ten years from now, we hope it'll be a bit more than that. So, you know, you're talking about 0.3 or 0.4% of uh, world GDP, perhaps 0.5% of rich country GDP. Small in the grand order of things, but no doubt people will find that a lot of money. But that's the kind of structure which I think we can build. I don't think we'll get there in its uh, entirety. But what I wanted to do was, by being numerical, to suggest that these kinds of numbers can be done. We've got a reasonably clear idea of the kinds of things we have to do to get there. The question now is to build an understanding um, across the globe in order to get an agreement. Now, this is the last thing that I want to say. That is the notion of a commitment. You often hear people in this context saying, that didn't work very well, a bit louder than that, but you see the intention, that commitments have to be binding, binding commitments. Sign in blood and get beaten up if you don't fulfill. Presumably be a combination of external enforcers from Mars and Venus who will come down and tell people what to do um, or punish them for not fulfilling what they said they would fulfill. I think we have to understand commitments partly in terms of an international understanding where informal sanctions could be there. You know, if you behave badly in, in international life on one dimension, you'll get treated less well on another. And that's fine. That's part of the, part of the story. But it's not necessarily formal binding story. Sometimes you can have these things as binding, but I think in the global agreement at this grand scale, the formality which we will need is not a formality that I think will have huge, heavy sanctions. What will these promises be? They'll in large measure be promises from countries to their own people. Uh, I mean, let me just give you an example. I mean, in the UK, we've got um, climate change legislation which obligates the government to meet targets which are largely set by a climate change committee which has been set up to be institutionally separate from government. And they will, each year, assess how the government has been doing and hold the government to account. It's political. It's political accountability. In China, a five-year plan is the law. So if the, if the 12th five-year plan goes on as standard schedule, the National People's Congress will sign it, will approve it, and it will become law in February of 2011. And then the local regional governments and people running firms and so on will be held to account to do those things. It's political accountability within a country according to the political constructs of that country. You have your own structures in the US with um, you know, the Supreme Court and other courts playing a role in the whole story. But it's internal accountability and that how it works depends on the political structure of the country at hand. The Australians throughout um, the uh, previous Prime Minister and elected Kevin Rudd partly because uh, of his uh, lack of commitment on climate change. Now, these kind of political processes have to be strengthened and codified within a country and I think your international obligation, which will have, you will have set down and will have been part of a treaty, should become, and the politics need to make it become, a difficult thing to break as regards the politics of your own country. And you will have various international sanctions. I mean, if people muck around on trade or nuclear proliferation or whatever it is, on other dimensions they get treated less well in the international system. As Scott knows much more of the detail about all of this than, than I do. But I worry, and this is really the last thing I'm going to leave and leave it in the air, I worry about an overlized, overly formalized approach to the notion of binding. Serious, strong, clear intentions shared with uh, other countries which um, could have some sanctions in the carbon markets or in the trade markets if they're not followed. But I think the primary force for most of this has to be an explained, clear international and domestic commitment but which is enforced largely through the domestic politics of the uh, particular countries.
So um, let me stop there. And uh, I've tried to tell a story of how strong the action has to be if we want to have growth and meet our carbon budgets, but also to tell the story in a way that says, yes, it's strong, but also if we really wanted to do it and have the growth and have the carbon budgets, I actually think we could. Thank you. Nick, that was absolutely great. Very interesting talk indeed. Perhaps I should have said something earlier, um, which is that uh, the reason Nick is here in New York at the moment is that uh, Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, is having a heads of state meeting on climate change tomorrow, and Nick will be telling them what he just told us. I really look forward to the idea of heads of state getting this kind of simple, rational, careful analysis of the issues there. Anyway, now to move on to the next stage, uh, Scott. Can I come and give, act as the first? Scott. Scott. Yeah, let's all sit here. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be on this distinguished panel. Um, Nick came to the climate change issue a little later than some other people, but he's had a much greater impact. So in addition to having my admiration, he has my envy. Um, he's really uh, galvanized the tension around this issue. And he's also stirred up debate, as uh, uh, Professor Heal uh, suggested earlier, within economics, and much of that around the idea of discounting. But I want to uh, – I'm not going to speak directly about the numbers, but I want to start off by just uh, laying out a very simple story about what we need to do about this problem that will not be numerical. I have trouble doing arithmetic in my head even though I specialize in advanced mathematical economics at the LSC. Um, theory is either easier than the numbers. But, um, uh, but I want to just sort of explain what the logic is about how we need to think about this issue. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about how, by, by how much should we allow um, temperature to increase. And then we back out from that by how much should concentrations be allowed to increase. Um, and I think what we do understand is that beyond some point, now there may be differences as to what the point is exactly, but beyond some point, um, temperature change brought about through increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases will be bad overall for the entire world. There's really no question about that. And so without even being numerical about what the um, concentration level would be, if you want to stabilize atmospheric concentrations at any level, you eventually have to reduce net emissions towards zero. So that path that Nick had of the emissions going down over time and trending toward the horizontal axis, that has to apply irrespective of the precise target you would have for concentrations. So we don't really have to have much of a disagreement about what we need to do in a qualitative sense. I think that story is, is pretty clear. And how do you uh, bring net emissions down to zero? Well, the only real feasible way to do it is through a technological revolution. So I think the challenge overall is to stimulate a technological revolution worldwide and to do it when the market is not going to do it all by itself. And this is absolutely unprecedented. Now, uh, Nick, if I remember from your uh, Stern review, um, or maybe in the speeches you made afterwards, one of the very catchy phrases you had, I think, was that climate change was the world's greatest externality, maybe yes. the greatest externality the in history, failure. The market greatest, failure. Greatest market failure the world's ever seen. Okay, the greatest market failure the world has ever seen. And, you know, economists are used to thinking about market failures, and we have an apparatus for understanding how to address them. Uh, but normally what we do is we appeal to uh, a government to intervene to correct the market failure by getting prices right or whatever the policies might be. And I think the climate problem, I've described it uh, a little differently, although the two views are certainly compatible, and that is that it's the greatest collective action problem in, in history. 
And the, there's a slight subtle difference between the two in the sense that the, the latter view about collective action reminds you that this is, uh, of course, is one world when it comes to the climate system, but it's also a world that comprises something like 192 states. And these are the ones who are making decisions. These are the ones who are meeting in New York. These are the ones who uh, are going to go to Copenhagen. And so somehow we have to bring into alignment the big picture that Nick has uh, characterized very usefully with the interests of these individual states. Now, he was getting in the, toward the end of his talk about this, uh, about this question about what states ought to do and how to um, create an environment that will support them uh, doing that. Um, but I think actually that is probably where the greatest challenge is. I think the numbers, in my view, are less of the problem uh, because qualitatively, if you think about what we've done about climate change, basically up to now we've done about nothing. I mean, that's true worldwide. It's approximately close to zero. Mm -hmm. And we know, and there's very, very wide agreement that that's wrong, that we should be doing much more than that. So the real question, I think, is how we can get countries to want to, uh, to, to, to take the action uh, that is really necessary. And that's the collective action problem. The approach that we've taken is, uh, you know, so far is, I think, really compatible with Nick's arithmetic in the sense that we've been thinking about this as a problem involving targets. We have a target, or some people have a target for limiting temperature change to 2 degrees centigrade. Or there may be a target perhaps backed out from that for a maximum concentration level. And then, of course, once you've got the concentration level, you disaggregate and you have targets for uh, individual countries. And this approach of setting targets and timetables for climate change began in 1988 at a conference in Toronto, and it's persisted ever since. And I think part of the problem in our approach to climate change has been to be fixated on this concept of targets and timetables. Because what it has done, uh, it, it has one virtue, of course, which is to focus attention on what needs to be done in a large sense, which is what Nick has emphasized. There also is the issue about responsibilities when you think of uh, disaggregating to look at the emissions of individual countries. Uh, but the problem is it has distracted us from actually doing things and ultimately to bring down, uh, to, to limit uh, concentrations, we're going to have to, as I said, transform technology worldwide and when the market won't want to do it all by itself. So I want to suggest a different way of uh, thinking about this. And that is to break this large problem up into smaller pieces. In many ways, it's almost the opposite of the, of the description that Nick just gave. Although, again, this is not a criticism. This is, you know, Nick is really looking at it from this perspective in a way, and I'm looking at it from this perspective. So I think that's the, the, key, the key thing. And, you know, in a way, the world has already voted with its feet and told us how we might start to think about this problem. Because while diplomats have been trying to negotiate uh, well, implement Kyoto, first of all, then negotiate a follow-on agreement, perhaps ready for Copenhagen. Uh, actions were taken um, two years ago in Montreal uh, for renegotiation of the Montreal Protocol. And this involved an adjustment for something called the controls of HCFCs. Now, H HCFCs um, are not a greenhouse gas, but the production of HCFCs produces HFCs as a byproduct, and HFCs are one of the greenhouse gases controlled by Kyoto. And this adjustment that was negotiated will reduce the emission of HFCs substantial, substantially. And we have confidence that this uh, will be undertaken because this agreement, the Montreal Protocol, has been extremely successful. And it's been successful because it has um, this combination of carrots and sticks. And it seems at the international level to bring about enforcement, you require this combination of carrots and sticks. Now, Nick emphasized toward the end of his talk that where he wanted to place the burden more was on domestic uh, pressures for compliance. And I think when you have a system that works really well, it's a combination of things that work. And I think the domestic, I think the, the belief that the obligations, for example, are legitimate is essential, which is where the numbers are very important. The um, belief that the allocations are fair is very important. 
Uh, having domestic support is essential. Um, that's, this is, of course, the problem with the United States not ratifying Kyoto. We didn't have domestic support here. Um, but I also think that the, the, the approaches that we've taken on a number of international issues that have been successful have been able to uh, change the incentives that the countries involved have to act. And really, that's through a combination of carrots and sticks. Now, so one concrete thing I think can be done for Copenhagen would be to have a protocol that would focus specifically on HFCs. You could actually just add them into the Montreal Protocol, even though they're not an ozone-destroying gas. But um, I think it would be better to actually have it as a separate protocol under the Framework Convention. Now, that's a small part of the total problem for sure, but now you've taken out one part, and now you go to the next part. Uh, two that would also be attractive to address in this kind of way would be uh, the other two industrial gases, um, SF6 and the PFCs, and then you could take those out. Then you have other issues, deforestation, which uh, Nick had up on his slide, uh, could be addressed through a separate treaty. Carbon is going to be difficult, for sure. But when we think about uh, the challenge of carbon and particularly getting not only the richer countries to act, but also get the poor countries to act, which is going to involve carrots, including financial transfers for new technologies, one of the missing components would be a technology like, and this is just an example, uh, power plant carbon capture and storage. If, if you know, emissions in, in, in China are rising rapidly because of the expansion in, in uh, coal-fired electricity generation. And this one technology, and we don't have up and running a large-scale project right now, so we don't know enough about the technology. But were we to learn more about this technology, uh, then we have uh, at our disposal a, um, uh, a means to start to bring China's emissions down without compromising growth. That is, you have uh, the basis for a deal. So the general point I want to make is that we need to look at this problem from the two perspectives. We need to look at it from the point of view of the world and our common interests and responsibilities, and I think that was really nicely portrayed by Nick. But we also need to look at it from the perspective of individual countries who have to get their electorates to support this, and that requires not only leadership by their own governments, it also requires an understanding that this truly is in the interests of um, these countries. So that, that's my main comment, that we need to do both of these things. We need to take the top-down perspective and the more bottom-up. Thanks very much indeed, Scott. Um, I'll just make some very brief remarks, and then we can get Nick's response and then turn it over to Q&A. Um, I very much like the framework that Nick set out. Uh, the basic arithmetic is compelling. Um, as Nick said, there really isn't an awful lot of scope for deviating from it. Um, so, and it's also actually very encouraging that the numbers, which at first sight look extremely challenging, are in fact consistent with, uh, potentially consistent at least with rates of uh, improvement in efficiency that are uh, being aimed at at least uh, by countries like China at the moment. So I, I really like that framework. I thought it was extremely informative and a very good perspective. The, um, <clears throat> I want to pick up something that, two things actually that Scott said. I think that the need for technological revolution at some point in the next 30 or 40 years in the production of energy is absolutely overwhelming. And that one of the things we have to do is encourage that. And so one of the things I think that Nick didn't mention, but he has mentioned elsewhere, is the need to encourage R&D in the energy area. Uh, I don't know quite what area that would be. Maybe energy storage would be one of the things that could make a, a real radical change in our ability, for example, to apply intermittent technologies like wind and solar. Um, and, you know, $10 billion, $20 billion of R&D in that sort of area could, make a, could possibly transform the game. Um, so I think there's a need for intervention in that sort of area. I like Scott's idea of picking off particular topics like HFCs and so on. And I've been advocating for quite a long time now uh, for picking off deforestation as an issue of that sort. Uh, and a deforestation cuts back, cut, generates about 20% of all greenhouse gas emissions. In the US, it generates about 25%. So deforestation is comparable to the US or China as a source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And it's relatively easy to stop. You just have to stop cutting trees. <laughs> you have, there's no massive investment in billions of dollars of new plant and equipment. There's no new technology. Uh, it's very easy to stop cutting trees, actually. 
Um, and it's actually relatively cheap in the sense that the money generated by, for poor countries by cutting these trees is rather minimal. Uh, so the opportunity cost to them of stopping cutting trees is, is low. So it's another topic we could pick off as a subject of a separate sub-treaty perhaps quite easily. And that's something which could be achieved within the next five to ten years. So there's a real chance of taking out 10 to 15 percent of global carbon emissions over a 10 to 15 year period uh, at relatively low cost if we focus on something, something specific like that. Um, I thought Nick's idea of summarizing the global deal in six numbers, or was it eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight numbers, uh, was interesting and, and very, very, uh, no, six numbers, wasn't it? Six numbers, right, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, very useful. Um, I want to talk about a couple of those. I mean, I think the 50, 35, 20, and 80, those are all basic arithmetic, and there obviously isn't a lot of scope for arguing with them. The last two numbers were the two numbers of 100 billion, thereabouts, uh, which were the... Uh, cash flows to uh, help with adaptation and mitigation in poorer countries. Um, actually, the World Bank just published uh, last week, actually, the uh, 2010 World Development Report, um, which I, I was on the editorial committee of, so I'm more familiar than most people with what's in it. And that has a long discussion of financing for mitigation and adaptation in developing countries. Um, and I have to say that um, although you know, 100 billion is not a lot of money, I mean, it's less, for example, than the U.S. government gave to the bailout AIG, just to put it in perspective. Um, so it's, you know, it's less than the value of one insurance company. Um, but nevertheless, it's more than total overseas development assistance from rich countries to poor countries. Um, and the chances of uh, increasing rich to poor country assistance by $200 billion, even over a period as long as 10 years, seems to be relatively slight. Um, and I think we need to think about other ways of generating that money. Um, and one of the things I think, I think there are other, other ways of generating that. And I think one could think of ways of using markets to generate that kind of cash flow. I mean, to some extent, that's happening anyway. I mean, the clean development mechanism, which I guess you're all familiar with, is a mechanism through which developing countries essentially sell, generate carbon offsets and sell them to corporations, not to governments, to corporations in industrial countries. And that generates a cash flow of the order of uh, $10, $20 billion, maybe $30 billion actually this year. Uh, from rich countries to poor countries, uh, which is support of mitigation. Um, if that market were increased, uh, if we had a market in uh, carbon offsets generated by reductions in deforestation, those things between them could generate cash flows you know, somewhere in the 50 to $100 billion range. Um, and those would be flows from rich to poor countries, but they wouldn't be government to government flows. They wouldn't be, depending on uh, political decisions, they'd be flows from uh, companies, carbon-constrained companies in rich countries uh, that were purchasing offsets from poorer countries. So there'd be a decentralized way of achieving that kind of outcome, uh, which I think would make it much easier to achieve. So I'd like to think, I'd like, you know, to, to think about, in, in, about using market mechanisms to some degree to generate those cash flows, because I don't think the political will is there in most industrial countries to significantly increase aid to developing countries, even though it should be there. Okay, I'll stop at that point um, and turn it back to Nick for just a couple of comments, and then we'll throw it open to you guys for Q&A. Um, thanks to Scott and, and Jeff for the, for the thoughts, and I don't have strong um, differences on them. The reason I spoke about um, uh, targets and growth and emissions per unit of output was that at the moment these are issues which are very strong in the discussions and, and I, th I think for understandable reasons and that I have actually spoken in this university before uh, on uh, the very important issues of the microeconomic mechanisms, the incentive structures and cap and trade and uh, carbon taxes and insurance mechanisms and so on um, and uh, direct support for R&D and indirect support through R&D through feed-in tariffs and so on. I have spoken about that and I wanted to actually focus on the numbers of uh, the moment, but that doesn't mean that there should be any less emphasis at all, quite the opposite, on um, mechanisms for actually getting there. And, uh, and I share what Scott and Jeff has had to say about these mechanisms. But there's one particular feature of this I think we have to constantly remind ourselves, or two. One is the scale of the risk. Now, the scale of the risk I tried to describe very deliberately at the beginning is just enormous. And to um, delay, and this is the second feature, 
is to really start bumping up those probabilities of really disastrous things happening to the planet as a whole. You know, not just an, a hurricane hitting a few more cities every now and again. I mean, it's actually a redrawing of the coastlines, the rivers, the deserts, and so on, of all the reasons why we live where we are, and uh, as such, you know, leading to very big movements of population. It's very important to constantly remind ourselves that first of those risks and second of the flow stop problem. Because the greenhouse gas is, at least the CO2 part of it, lasts for so long that there's a ratchet effect. The more you delay, the bigger the problem. And that's why I think that the urgency and the scale of risk has to permeate everything. And uh, it's not a question of, of saying, well, let's leave it 10 years till we've found out a bit more. You know, that's probably another 30 parts per million. And uh, taking, you know, your 435 up to 465, even in, with good strong action, you start running into 550 or 600 parts per million. And if you look at the probability tables, you know, the probability of going above 3, 4, 5 degrees centigrade are really not small if you move up to 600 or so parts per million. So that's the kind of risk that we run and the driving urgency behind it. And it's the ratchet effect, the flow stock story. Um, the second thing is, is, is interesting to speculate, and I take what you said, Scott, about action being slow. But why was action slow? Is it because we formulated the problem wrongly? It may be, and it may be to do with defects in Kyoto. But I think the basic reason is we simply weren't serious. We weren't serious as a world in taking on this problem. This has been politically strong and, and as an issue, and strong as an issue in business, really only for three or four years. And um, the problem, the analysis of the problem in terms of something catching the heat and stopping it, it, top, stopping it disappearing from the Earth's atmosphere goes back to Fourier in the 1820s. So, you know, the climate science was sounding such strong alarms that they formed the IPCC in 1988. And of course, there was a campaign to form it before they formed it. So there's some sense in which the understanding of the science goes back nearly 200 years, and the understanding of the urgency and the criticality of all this goes back something like 25 or 30 years. But as a political issue, and as a business issue, I think it's young. And uh, it's a focus on just you know, the population as a whole, or much of it now, on the risks that I think has changed the possibility of, um, of action. And that's why I think those political processes and the process of explanation um, still have to be uh, very strong. Now, one thing that the three of us shared very strongly, and all of us mentioned, and is uh, very clear from the simple numbers, if you just talk about cutting emissions unit output by a factor of four in uh, 20 years, is the story of doing things differently and radical change in technology. And there, I think, is the cheerfulness as well as the difficulty. Because it's amazing how think fast things can happen if you really want them to. Um, France went from very little electricity nuclear to 70 or 75 percent of electricity nuclear in 20 years. You know, that was commitment. Um, uh, there are other examples. If you look at the way in which Brazil revolutionised its car industry, isn't a similar period, uh, a similar period of time. I mean, Portugal has gone enormously strongly in the direction of uh, solar and wind. They may have made mistakes along the way and not done it brilliantly, but they've done that very quickly too. So I actually think that um, whilst we start with an infrastructure which is there and we can't just simply redraw overnight, 20 years is actually long enough to make very big changes, and the four decades to 2050 are surely enough to actually decarbonize electricity completely in most parts of uh, the world, and that gives you um, decarbonized uh, road transport and uh, rail transport. So there are actually big changes that we can make, and of course the most important one to do very quickly is uh, stopping deforestation well, along with very rapid change in energy 
efficiency. You know, we've changed the light bulbs of, what's the, what are the, the rules on light bulbs here in the US now? I mean, it, can, you, can you buy a, an incandescent light bulb? Yeah, you can, but they're being phased out. So oh, okay. But they're being phased out very quickly in, uh, in Europe. You know, there'll be a period when the non-incandescent light bulbs don't sort of work quite as well as the incandescent ones. But, you know, if you're forced to do it, there will be a very rapid change. So it's a combination, I think, of regulation and direct action, combination of the price mechanism, combination of investing sensibly in R&D and, uh, and deployment, and all the difficult economics of ideas and so on that we have to uh, bring to bear. But I think seeing it as a uh, question of redrawing the technologies pretty well totally on the energy front by 2050 is actually a good way to look at it and perfectly possible and uh, but just involves very strong focus and determination and and uh, an application um, finally I didn't say where the hundred billion came from I, I do indeed agree with with Jeff that uh, most of the hundred billion for mitigation uh, will come through uh, the markets if we do it well uh, the 100 billion for adaptation depends on, um, at a very crude level, people's goodness. Uh, there is um, a direct incentive for us to help other people with mitigation. It's strongly in our interests to do that, uh, to share the technologies, to see if we can find markets, to give real incentive structures to make people move ahead. That's part of the collective action problem. That's part of the incentive structure. That's not the same with adaptation. The, the argument for adaptation support is fundamentally different. It's the feeling that we should do it. You know, because uh, other people are least responsible, they get hit earliest, earliest and hardest, they're much poorer than, than we are. It's a different kind of argument. Um, it's gonna be much easier to get the 100 billion for mitigation I don't say it's easy, but it's much easier, but it's done through um, setting uh, market structures that could generate that. The other one is a matter of, I think, making uh, the moral argument together with the effectiveness argument that you can actually design it to uh, produce the results. So um, that different status, I think, is very important in thinking about the likelihood of it happening and the kind of arguments you need to marshal to um, promote it. Okay, we've got a bit of time left, so um, I'm happy to take questions for points for discussion from the audience. Uh, there's a mic right in the middle there, so I'd like you to actually, we're recording this, so could you take your, pose a question? We'll take a couple of questions and we'll get a response. So, this gentleman, the gentleman at the back there, and Cynthia, we'll take three questions and then we'll get a response. Um, Lord Stern, I, I uh, share, I think, and appreciate your vision of this, or your framing of this issue in terms of opportunities and you know, opportunities in investment and also in new technologies and one of the things that I see when I look at 2020 or 2025 or so which is something that Professor Heal alluded to earlier is exactly this opportunity through the carbon market which you also mentioned and when I when I see these pathways or these guide paths for 450 or 400 there is what I see a bit of headroom out in 2020. So if you assume that industrialized countries take on targets, there is enough room in there for some kind of budgets for developing countries. And that could potentially be a opportunity under a global trading system for large transfers of money, uh, large transfers or transfers via the carbon market through the mandatory carbon market. To what degree do you feel that has been part of the discussion when, when countries have talked about the opportunities and the potentials for flow in terms of possibly early targets, I guess in the parlance of the negotiations, it will be something called growth budgets that countries like China, India could take on these targets and receive potential assistance in the near term to help them on to a, a low carbon future. Thanks. Okay, we'll take three questions and I'll ask Nick to respond to them. Hi, thank you very much. I'm a former alum and currently at the UNDP. So How do you become a former um, alum? <laughs> man of such thing. Uh, a couple of, uh, or rather alum, not former. Forgive former me. student is an alum, um, right? Uh, forgive my skepticism a bit. Um, eight years ago, we were 
discussing terrorism as the main challenge of the 21st century. Um, if green you economy... <laughs> out here in New York, so it was a bit bizarre. Uh, if green economy is such a growth and investment engine, as, as perhaps you put it better than railways, or as Blair puts it, creator of 10 million jobs, then why the resistance when politicians, I guess, stand a better chance of being re-elected if uh, economies grow? Is the science not correct or the narrative is missing? Um, next, I was considering the problem of um, things that you haven't discussed. The benefits of high growth, high emissions have largely accrued in the West. And uh, the pain of high emissions now must be tackled together. So. Um, do you suppose truly that same levels of growth are actually possible that you, that you state um, if real science would back it, then why would, is there so much rancor by India or others against this? Um, this goes more for Scott, the idea of uh, technological revolution, top down versus bottom up. I was wondering if there could be a way to discuss technolo technologies that actually already exist in rural communities um, believing the global, uh, global south could be the driving engine for technologies for how about, let's say, tomorrow when you do meet uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, addressing that, uh, throwing out the challenge to the global south that you come up with the solutions, the global north will, at least in the adaptation side, in the goodwill side, think about the um, financing of it. Um, and a last couple of things. Um, the carbon trade, uh, credits trading, you have not discussed perhaps first international trade exchange versus internal, in-country trade exchanges within, let's say, the Western Hemisphere. And the last thing I'll say is there has been a controversial sort of point of view from the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton that um, advancements in biology, whether it's DNA, genomics, or, or evolution, have, uh, have not been accounted for in some of the considerations of the doomsday view that we are taking of climate change. I wonder if you could discuss when you take the story of the 30 million years or 200,000 that whether that takes into account evolutionary bio biological uh, transformations that may or may not be relevant to your discussion. I'll stop there. I have a few more. <laughs> I have just one. <laughs> uh, this is about how do we get from here to there and asking um, your thoughts on the role of cities and really the neglected role of urban areas because they are s responsible for so much of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions because um, many of them are located on coastlines. There's tremendous uh, vulnerability there. And the cities themselves have been organizing in bottom-up organizations such as the C40 large cities of the world. And their motto is of C40, their motto is cities act. What the unspoken part of their motto is while nations talk. So I think that, again, as Scott is saying also, let's, let's kind of uh, open this up a little bit. Think about new ways of, of getting this to happen, and, and, one, and I think role of cities is one of them. So comments on that it would be appreciated. Um, the, in, in, in the first two um, uh, sets of questions, there were questions about uh, offsets and uh, incentives and carbon markets. I mean, I do think that um, the uh, trade in emissions reductions does have um, a valuable role to play for the simple reason that trade has a valuable role to play. You know, you buy your shirts from where the shirts are made most <laughs> cheaply and buying emissions reductions where emissions reductions come most cheaply makes sense for us all. The difference is, of course, we have to recognize emissions reductions, and they're a little more difficult to recognize than a shirt. Um, but we're going to have to have ways of understanding what they are. I think we understand when deforestation has been stopped and reversed. I think uh, we understand if a plant has uh, carbon capture and storage and electricity. I think we understand the difference between hydro and, and coal. You know, we can handle that story, even though uh, it does involve some complication. But I think there are some big, big, simple cases where we can get 
a long way. So I do think the offset story has to uh, be a big part and can help with the right kind of um, incentives and keeping costs down. We're going to have to make those markets work. Uh, we've noticed, at least some of, some of you have, that financial markets don't always work terribly well. And, but you don't give up banks or financial markets. Uh, you don't scrap mortgages because some people were using them badly and stupidly and the regulators weren't doing their job. All this is true, but what you have to do is to try to find ways of making those markets work. And again, this is a very young story, but the story of learning in the European Union emissions trading scheme is one actually of crass mistakes but quickly recognised and starting to be reversed. And this is a market that's only three or four uh, years old. So those learning processes will be part of the story, but I do think the offsets are very important. There were, some, there were some, a few things that were sort of surfacing at various points during the second questioner's contribution. There was you know, things like real science and doomsday, um, and that somehow those people who are not totally convinced instantly have some insight into real science that real scientists don't. Um, if you go to any bar, i uh, talking about the UK now, I wouldn't dream of talking about the US. If you go to any bar or have your hair cut, there are people who have views on all sorts of things. Is it because they have some searing insight that the scientists haven't had? I think you have to look very carefully at what the science tells you, why it tells you that, what the arguments are, and you have to learn from the scientists. If you wanted to learn about nuclear physics, then you'd go to someone who was very good at nuclear physics. This is not complex in its basics, this story. But the scientists do identify, and have identified since the middle of the 19th century, which gases it were, which gases there were, that was stopping heat passing through. And they did it experimentally, they measured the effects by the end of the 19th century. Arrhenius got his Nobel Prize then for work he did in the 1890s on this kind of thing. It's, it's old science. We've got climate scientists in the audience who can explain it much more in much more detail than I can. But it's not mysterious. It's not some kind of dreamy stuff. It's practical stories which have um, been tested in laboratories, tested in uh, various ways. You've got ice cores now going back 800,000 years that are giving you these kinds of relationships as well. Wherever the evidence comes from, it all builds up and looks the same way. So I was a bit puzzled to hear that somehow the um, people who are not convinced that we must get on with this uh, are somehow uh, for reasons of, um, of science. Now what about though that e the opposition that comes from economic change? This is real. This involves dislocation. Now, when the uh, when no word processes came in, people making typewriters were dislocated. When electricity came in, people who were making candles out of whale blubber were dislocated. That story of rapid economic change and the dislocation that's embodied will involve political pushback. It will involve political pushback for very understandable reasons. And we have to try to uh, be conscious of that and bring in the kind of policies that help us deal with that kind of um, change. But I don't want to minimise that, but it's not to do with somehow not seeing the technologies or not seeing the science. It's to do with real dislocation associated with very rapid change. That has to be managed. Um, what about the opportunities and are they real? Well. I emphasised the, the China story, not only because I've been working there for 20 years on and off and got back a, a week ago from my most recent visit, but also, of course, their magnitude in uh, emissions and the potential growth of emissions. Um, they have seen very strongly that for them this is a huge market. They have been expanding in large measure through penetration of world markets for manufacturers. They've now got to the point in those markets where their future growth will be dependent on the growth of those markets. Those markets will grow at 25 3%. You don't get overall growth rates of 7 or 8%, which is what they would want to continue from those markets. They've essentially got three sources. One is something they've been 
talking about and discussing for a long time, which is growth in domestic consumption. The second is growth in the service sector, which is still quite small in China uh, relative to other countries. But what they're really looking for now is big growth through um, these new technologies. They see this as an enormous growth area for them, and they're pouring over the details of how that could happen. It's a country where a big chunk of the Politburo um, did engineering at Tsinghua University. They're interested in detail. They're interested in how it's done, what it will cost, what investments have to be made when. And their analysis of this points very strongly in the direction that uh, I've been arguing. I gave a talk to people managing assets um, here in New York last Wednesday, where people in the room were managing $13 trillion of assets. They were hugely interested in these as long-term Invest, invest, investors. Now, I offer these one perspective from Beijing and another perspective from Wall Street. But that's people with real money making real investments taking these issues uh, extremely seriously. Will ideas come from the global south? They're already coming from the global south. I was with a guy called uh, Harish Hande today who has been doing microfinance and local solar heaters in. Um, Karnataka, uh, one of the big states in southern India, a population of 40, 50 million people, and doing very well in a, something which is not, maybe not revolutionary from technology, but it's good local technology and coupled with micro uh, microfinance, um, biofuels, and um, Brazil. SunTech is the, bigger, is the biggest... Uh, Company, Suntech, a, a Chinese company, is the biggest company in solar. We shouldn't think of this about technology transfer. This is technology sharing, and it's going to come from uh, all over the place. You have wonderful work being done in California and elsewhere on uh, all sorts of things. Um, you can't give a talk to business people without going away with your pocket full of cards of people who are working on... Uh, algae, nano batteries, uh, you know, just the list is, is endless. If only 10% of these things work, we'll probably be in quite, uh, quite good shape. So I think you're going to see it from the equivalent of the Silicon Valleys of the, uh, the West to rural Karnataka to biofuels in Brazil. You're going to see a whole raft of ideas coming at us from uh, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of places. Finally, on the uh, oh, on evolutionary biology. Well, fruit flies, you know, have a much faster pace of change than uh, human beings, and they're the kind of thing that we're going to have to adjust to if we don't manage this properly. It's just way beyond the speed that human beings have ever had to deal with. I mean, three or four degrees in a century. I mean, that really is far, far faster and way beyond evolutionary biology in any. Um, obvious uh, statement of the term as it applies to human beings. On the role of cities, well, Cynthia, I mean, all I can do is say that uh, I agree. And uh, again, uh, you can see the potential for innovation all the way from, you know, the Valib and the free bikes, not the free bikes, the public bikes in, uh, in Paris to uh, public uh, transport systems, <coughs> for electric private cars and the uh, charging stations on, on parking meters, uh, changing, uh, changing zoning rules so it's easier for people to live in the centre of town. People are moving back into the centre of London now, um, partly as a result of public uh, policy. Of course, you can always make the tubes bad enough that they... Uh, <laughs> but uh, that I wouldn't recommend as a policy. You make public transport even better. But there, there's so many things that are involved. Um, technical progress in buildings now. I mean, I just insulated my house with insulation stuff like that that does far, far better than stuff that five years ago would have looked like that. You know, you've got technical progress in windows. And you've got technical progress in roofs. I mean, it's just pervading at the pace of all this um, with only modestly good, if then that's being charitable, public policy. Now, if you think of a much more deliberate story of, in, uh, of pushing and encouraging, fostering 
incentivizing that kind of technological change, I think there's a tremendous scope, both for community action. You know, you can't reuse or recycle other than in a community. You can't have public transport other than uh, in a community. You can't have combined heat and power other than in a community. And when you see communities getting together to do these things, now we're hard-nosed economists and we think of sticks and carrots, and we should because you abandon those ideas at your peril. But actually, when communities get together and work out together what they can do, it's remarkable the dynamism that, uh, that comes through. So more power to your elbow. Or whatever instrument you're using. <laughs> yeah. okay. Regrettably, we're out of time, unfortunately. We've gone somewhat over time already, so I'd like to bring things to a close and thank Nick and Scott very much indeed for a fascinating evening. Thank you very much indeed.